it's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, digging into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my special guest is Dr. Francis Miles, and we're going to be talking about his brand new book, Dangerous Prayers from the Courts of Heaven That Destroy Evil Altars, Establishing the Legal Framework for Closing Demonic Entryways and Breaking Generational Chains of Darkness. Dr. Miles, it is always an honor to speak with you. Welcome back to the show. Well, Sean, I'm very happy to be on your show out to be discussing yet another life-changing book. Amen, amen. And we were just talking about before we got into the interview, your previous book that you did with Destiny Image changed so many lives. We get so much strong feedback. And I have high expectancy for this new book. I think it's going to actually exceed the response we saw to the last one. Um, if people want to get to know more about you, I'll share a link to our earlier message. I want to get right into uh, the important message of this new book. One of the things you start out early on is talking about the three realms of prayer. Uh, let's touch base on some of that foundational material. Yes, in the book, uh, because this book is about really hitting, hitting head on the global uni, uh, universal problem of unanswered prayer in the body of Christ. Uh, in this book on the uh, dangerous prayers from the courts of heaven that destroy evil altars, it was very important for me, uh, Sean, to establish a foundation for prayer before we can even go into section two of the book, which, which we call the book of dangerous prayers that have been crafted for people to get massive breakthroughs. So in, in, so in section one, uh, relating to your question, uh, it was important for me to be able to uh, give people a basic understanding that there are three realms of prayer, at least there are three realms of prayer that Jesus put prayer in, okay? And so we, went, we go through the, in Luke chapter 11, when Jesus is asked by his disciples, teach us how to pray like John told his disciples. And then Jesus immediately goes into answering the question about teach us how to pray. So everything that comes after this is Jesus responding to the question on how to pray. And so the first thing he says, he says, when you pray, pray our Father, what in heaven, allowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. And then he goes on. And so in the first realm of prayer, Jesus is teaching us, teaching believers how to approach God as Father. So there's a realm of prayer that is based on the fact that you now know that, you are, that God is now your father through your relationship with Jesus Christ. Of course, if you're calling God your father, then it's implying that you're already born again. Because according to John 1, 12, it says, to as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become children of God. So you cannot call God your father uh, unless you have a relationship with Jesus. So that's the implication of the first realm. And then Jesus continues, and then in the same phrase, in the same passage, he continues on and changes, changes the terminology from father to friend. And start talking about the parable of, some, of a friend who comes to an influential friend at midnight on, an, on behalf of another friend. You know, and, he, and, and, uh, and essentially Jesus now tries, tries to show us that there's a, there's a second realm of prayer where we can approach God, not as father. In this realm, we approach God as friend. And in the parable, it's clear the one, the friend was approaching the influential friend on behalf of another friend was, uh, was leveraging, was doing it on behalf of somebody else. In other words, the friend in the story did not have a need. It was the f another friend who came asking for, for who, need, who had a need. And then this other friend leveraged his friendship with another friend who has all the resources the other one needs. So there's actually three friends in the story. The one with the need and the friend uh, who, who, who knows the one who, who uh, and, and, and another friend who has a relationship with, um, with, uh, with, with another friend who has the resources that are needed to be able to meet the solution. What, what that realm is, is a realm of, in, of intercession. But Brother Sean, in the realm of intercession, we leverage, we as believers get the opportunity to do the most uh, selfless thing we can ever do in life. That is to lay our lives down on behalf of somebody else 
who has a need, not us. Because our individual needs are met in the first realm when we approach God as Father. But in the realm of intercession, we cease from looking at uh, praying for ourselves. We begin to approach God, say, God, deliver somebody because we have asked you to. So there in the second realm of prayer, friendship is a big deal. So this is the realm of intercession. Because the true intercession is not me praying for Francis Mouse. That is not intercession as the Bible understands it. You are always praying for somebody else to get the deliverance. And so then in the third realm, Jesus moved the third realm to chapter 18. We don't get to the third realm until we get to chapter 18 of the book of Luke, where Jesus takes it up again to teach on prayer. And he begins to say, men ought always, not, or men ought always to pray and not to faint. You know, and then he begins to talk about there was a widow in a certain city, you know, who went to an unrighteous judge, a corrupt judge, who did not fear God, did not care about man, because she wanted this judge to deliver her from her adversary. So we see that in this realm of prayer, Jesus uses, uses judicial terminology to explain prayer in this dimension. This is a realm called the courts of heaven, and many of the unanswered prayers by examining, because I've been part of the prayer movement, Brother Sean, for many, many years coming out of Africa, but I came to realize that the missing link to the unanswered prayer of most believers is the inability to recognize there's the third realm of prayer where everything legal can be dissolved that could be holding the prayers from being answered. And in this book on the dangerous prayers, we deal with that third realm of prayer before we begin to expose our readers to the dangerous prayers. Well, thank you for giving us a, a little bit more clarity on those three realms of prayer. Next, I'd love to get some of your insights on the two types of altars. Talk to us about righteous and evil altars. What do we need to know there? That's very interesting. So, um, so first and foremost, I want to explain the concept of altars so that those who are listening can understand what we're even talking about. Because most people think when you talk about altars, you're talking about something Old Testament. But the altars are not Old Testament. When you understand what they do, what, what God designed them for, then you realize that neither, neither the Old nor New Testament can exist without altars. As a matter of fact, altars are even in heaven itself. So not even heaven can exist without altars. So it's important to understand what an altar is. And then I'm going to explain the two types of altars. Well, in the book of Genesis 1.26, Brother Sean, God did something that God did something that necessitated this platform called an altar. In the book of Genesis 1 26, God says, let, let, God said, let us make man after let us make man after our image and after our likeness. Then he uses two words that Brother Sean would forever change the relationship between God and man. It's the two words, let them. Those words are very exclusive to man. Let them have dominion. Let them have dominion on earth, on earth. That word dominion comes from the Hebrew word mamlakra, which means to have kingdom, to have complete authority. To, to have complete authority, it means to have rulership. It means to have leadership. So God gives them. Now the question becomes, who is them? Well, the, next, the, the very next verse, 27 of Genesis 1, explains who them are. It is male and female. So them is spirits, housed in bodies of dirt because female and male have to do with gender and gender is based on the flesh because the spirit have, spirits have no gender. So the gender issue has to do with the flesh. So God said, let them, male and female. So what is God saying? Mamlaka, dominion has now been given, has been given to two spirit, to, 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 to two entities, male and female. In other words, the, a spirit in a male body, a spirit in a female body, are the only people God gave dominion to on the earth. Now, because God said, let them, and he never said, let them and us, it means by God saying, let them, dominion became exclusive, dominion over earth became exclusive to male and female. That means God now had put himself in a venerable place, which means God himself, by, by divine law, God himself being a spirit, could no longer come into, into earth without asking or looking for human cooperation. That's what the, mean, the mamlaka, the, the dominion did to man and God. He said, now God, by saying, let them, only these two entities, male and female, let them have dominion on the earth. It means God has to ask for permission of the cooperation of a man before he can do anything in the earth. 
In other words, by the, the law of dominion, uh, earth became the world of men. But earth literally became the world of men. That means spirits must now re, uh, re, must, must engage a man in order to, uh, to have expression in the world of men. Now, so uh, uh, my late mentor, Dr. Miles Monroe, used to put it this way. You know, according to the law of dominion, spirits without bodies of dirt on earth are illegal unless they are functioning through a human. This means, therefore, God would need a platform or a place of exchange, okay? And that's what's very interesting is this, that in God's genius, here's what he did. You know, in, in dominion or mamlaka, he gave authority over the earth to men, but he kept power in the realm of spirit. So we are given authority, mamlaka, but not power, supernatural power. Supernatural power remained to the world of spirit. So now you have authority in the world of men through mamlaka or dominion, but you've got power in the hands of God. That's what the Bible says, uh, twice have I, one, God has spoken once, but twice have I heard that power belongs to God. So guess God leaves power in the world of spirit, authority in the world of, 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 of men or, or terrestrial realm of men. Therefore now, God says, okay, if you want power, if you want to exchange your authority for power, and I need your authority, guess what? We are going to have to have a meeting place. So God devised a legal meeting place or a gate that would, that would allow uh, the interfaces between the world of flesh and the world of spirit. That gate that would stand between the world of spirit and the world of flesh is called an altar. It would become a meeting place where spirits and physical people or spirits and men can meet to negotiate powerful authority and vice versa on legal grounds. That instrument that will, that will forever be act as a gate between the world of spirit and the world of flesh is called an altar. An altar. And therefore, this, because this is, uh, 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 this is the case, Satan, who is a master copycat, see, the devil is not original, but he knows how to copy the original one, and that's God. When Satan saw how God was legally coming into the world of men by, 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 ga by gaining the cooperation of Adam and Eve, he realized, okay, if that's how he's getting in legally, he's coming through an altar, a place of exchange, but there's, there's, there's human cooperation. If I can get human cooperation, I'm also a spirit, I can come into the world of men. That's why the serpent comes to Eve to get permission because when Eve, Eve listens to the serpent and chooses the voice of the serpent above the voice of God, that's an agreement that happened. She agreed with the voice of the serpent more than the voice of God that said, you shall not eat of the fruit. By both of them eating of the fruit, they came into agreement. That agreement produced the first evil altar in the Bible. So when you move forward from that, now you find two brothers, Cain and Abel. This is where you see the, the ep, this is where I see the climaxing, the clear, distinct uh, operation of two altars in the earth. So both brothers bring uh, an offering to the Lord. You know, Cain brings the best fruit from his, of his offering, from his kettle. Uh, he gives it to the Lord. And then, he, uh, and then he, also his brother Cain builds an altar, but he puts vegetables on it. God refuses to, ref God refuses to acknowledge the offering of Cain but he acknowledges and responds to the, to the an offering of, of, of Abel. Now, how did Cain know he had been rejected while his brother had been accepted? Because in the Old Testament, every time God accepted an offering on an altar, fire came down from heaven. So he, there was a visible manifestation that God had re reacted positively to, to, to Abel. There was a glory of the Father God was released on the altar to consume the offering. But God refused to do the same thing for Cain. Now, why didn't God not do it? Because I understand that, you know, they were trying to atone for their sins, okay? And God had already shown the Adam and Eve that only the blood of something innocent can atone for sin because God was the first one to kill an animal so that he could clothe them with, uh, with, the, cl with the clothing of blood because they had sinned and God had to cover them because God cannot look on sin, but he can cover it with the blood. So Cain must have known that from Adam and Eve. But out of rebellion, he didn't want to give God what he wanted. He wanted God to accept whatever Cain wanted to give to him on his altar. 
Now, why is this, why is this important? Because this now will determine the characteristics, the nature of an evil altar versus a righteous altar. A righteous altar gives to God what he needs. An evil altar is, is, is built in defiance to God's law, is the building, it's built in defiance to God's who to who God is. In other words, and then the power and the purpose of the, the an evil altar or the unrighteous altar is to give birth to the accursed thing. Why did God reject the vegetables? Because remember, the vegetables are the fruit of the ground. And in Genesis chapter 3, God had already cursed the ground. So how dare you can offer to God an offering from a ground that's already been cursed by God? So that also gives us the nature of the evil order. The evil order is designed primarily to do one thing, to give life in our lives to the accursed thing. That is the difference between evil and righteous altars. And, you know, altars, often a place of blood. How does the power of Jesus' blood relate to altars? Oh, man, that is very powerful because in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, the Bible says, you know, he says, I have given, I have, he says, I have, I have given, uh, he said to me, uh, I, 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 he said, the life of all flesh is in the blood. The life of all flesh is in the blood. And therefore, I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for the soul. Okay. So we find that the what now why is the, we find that the blood, according to God, I draw scripture, it means the only legal place. Because an altar is a place of exchange, and blood represents life, okay? Blood represents life, okay? Therefore, the only legitimate place, the most, the, because God will never do anything illegal. In other words, God will never break his own word. Everything God does must be legal, okay? God, God, cannot, God is not the devil. He's, he's God. He never breaks his own law because a king who breaks his own law is not a king worth having. So... Therefore, because the only platform God designed himself where spirits can meet men and exchange strengths, exchange strength or negotiate, was an altar. Therefore, Leviticus says, since the life of all flesh is in the blood, I have taken the blood and given it to you on the altar. Why? Because the altar is the only legal point of entry for spirits in the world of men. The altar is the only legal point where men can, can, can meet with divinity on legal grounds. Therefore, when the blood of Christ was shed, glory to God, God had only one place he could keep, put it. It was placed on the altar. That's why in the book I talk about, uh, I, I go in, I don't want to get it for myself, but in the book I do talk about the, uh, the seven places where Jesus shed his blood are seven, are seven altars because God already tells us this. I have placed the blood, that's the Leviticus 17 verse 11. I have given to you the blood on the altar. So I tell people, watch for where God puts blood because God is not like humans. We can shed innocent blood on the, innocent blood for nothing. But God does not spill blood unless there's a purpose for it and he's putting it only in one place where blood can be put legally by God who does not break his own law, the altar. So that's why it's very important for us to understand this is why we can exchange our sinful life for the life of Jesus because his blood was shed legally and placed at the right platform where we can exchange, uh, we can exchange our inequities for his uh, 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 flawlessness, all that kind of stuff. Wow, that's, that's so encouraging. Uh, Dr. Miles, I appreciate you giving us kind of the overview of righteous and evil altars, how that relates to Jesus' blood. And I, I really liked what you uh, explained about the altars being kind of a, a gateway. Uh, that, that was a very helpful perspective. Uh, let's get into the, the latter half of the book. Um, I'm so excited you include 36 dangerous prayers to uproot altars. Uh, just just give an, an overview of what one of those prayers looks like and uh, what are some of the, the topics that you tackle in that latter part of the book? Well, you know, uh, you know thank you, man, for asking. You, you know, one of the things you, earlier on in the broadcast, you, you alluded to how well my first book that I did with Destiny Image called Issuing Divine Restraining Orders worked. It was very successful, primarily because of the fact that 
there were some 18 prayers on how to issue different types of divine restraining orders. And I realized that most people, uh, they want to pray, they just don't know how. You know, they want to pray. They know they're supposed to pray. They know it's important for them to pray. But the reality is they don't know how to do it. They pray amiss. So what, I, what we did in this book is we created a second section, okay? After we deal with section one, which creates a foundation for prayer, the importance of it, you know, and, the, and uh, when, uh, unraveling the mystery of unanswered prayer. After we did all of that, we move in section two, which is what you are referencing to, which we call in the book, the book of dangerous prayers. Now, first and foremost, let me explain the word dangerous prayers. Why do I call the book dangerous prayers? Because you see, any prayer that is guaranteed to be, to be heard by the Lord, any prayer that is guaranteed to be answered by the Lord on behalf of a believer is a dangerous prayer to the devil. Because that prayer means whatever the devil had, had been doing in that person's life comes to an end when they use that prayer. So that's why we call it the book of dangerous prayers. Now, you ask me about some of the things we've kind of uh, alluded to in, the, in, the, in uh, some of the prayers we have done. Well, we've got uh, prayers on how to overthrow the evil author of witchcraft. Because witchcraft is a perversive problem in the world we live in today. It doesn't matter. In the West, in, the, in Asia, it doesn't matter. Witchcraft is a universal spirit. And wherever you go, nations are dealing with witchcraft in one way or the other. By the way, we are in October. Guess what America is about to celebrate? Halloween. Nothing but witchcraft. So, and then, but then there's witch, you know, so, I, so in this book, we have a, 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 a prayers on how to overthrow witchcraft. We have pray, uh, prayers on how to overthrow evil authors of premature death. We've got uh, prayers on how to overthrow the evil author of barrenness, fear, trauma, failure, even marriage breakers, you know. Uh, I, mean, I mean, Freemasonry, that's a big deal because Freemasonry is a big deal in the bloodlines of so many believers. I mean, familiar spirits, you know, you took a Leviathan. I mean, this book is loaded with very powerful, dangerous prayers on different type of evil altars and the spirits that operate behind them. And I'm telling you, Brother Sean, anybody who takes this book seriously, prays the prayers, is going to experience Massive breakthroughs. Now, the prayers themselves, man, they are very thorough. You know, I made sure the prayers were designed in such a way that if a baby Christian who has never heard about the court of heaven gets the book of dangerous prayers from the court of heaven that destroy evil altars, that baby Christian, when they begin to pray those prayers, their prayers will be so powerful because of their intelligence, their accuracy, and their power and their potency that they are going to get a breakthrough no matter what. So this is what we did. So we designed about 36 of these dangerous prayers. That means we identified 36 evil altars that are very common to human life. We pretty much got everybody covered with this, these prayers. Well, th that deserves an amen. I mean, I, I've looked at the list of prayers and read through many of them, and these are the sorts of things we're all dealing with right now. I, I know many people are going to be dramatically impacted when they spend the time working through these prayers. They're going to be massively life-changing, so you're going to want to check those out. Uh, Dr. Miles, in terms of all of us connecting with you, finding out more about where you're speaking, your, your many books and teachings, where do we discover you on the web? Well, on the World, World Wide Web, thank you, thank you for asking. Since you can discover me on francismouse.com and also you can sub, people can subscribe to my YouTube channel, Francis Mouse International. And then on Facebook, Dr. Francis Mouse is my official page, public page that I have where I engage with a lot of my followers aggressively on a weekly basis. So again, francismouse.com is my website. And then we've got... Uh, then we've got um, um, YouTube, where we, we, we upload many of my teachings around the, the country uh, on Francis Miles International. And then we've got Facebook, which is Dr. Francis Miles. You type it in, my, my, book will come, my, my public page will come out, and people can connect with me that way. And we'll make it easy for you, like we do with every episode. We'll have links in the show notes to 
all the places Dr. Miles mentioned that you can connect with him and also links to where you can pick up your very own copy of his brand new book. It's time to bring this episode of the Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Dr. Francis Miles. Again, our book today was Dangerous Prayers from the Courts of Heaven that Destroy Evil Altars. And Dr. Miles, I always enjoy our time together. Thank you so much for pouring into us today. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's, it's exciting.